I've got a little confession to make. I used to think therapy was bullshit. Then somebody drove the wrong way down a motorway on purpose at 100 miles an hour, hits me in a car, I roll three times, land upside down, and as I hang there, I think, yeah, I think I'm going to have to talk to somebody about this. Don't worry, everybody was totally fine, physically, at least. Although he did only get a three-year driving ban, so you could say that I'm still a little bit pissed. While I'm no longer in neurological distress, it has taken me a very long time to get here. And after a year of not being able to breathe while simply being a passenger in a car and getting to the point where I was actually really nervous to just be a pedestrian on the pavement walking past cars, finally taking the time to talk to people and research and read about therapy and then in fact experiencing it myself, I have to admit, I was really bloody wrong. So in the true spirit of this channel, I am gonna go through some of the lies I believed about going to therapy and why I was wrong about them. Now, before we go any further, I must make a disclaimer. My experience, like everyone's to some extent, is limited. I am only speaking from my own experience and the information available in my country. I am truly a beginner level at this, but I wanted to make this video to show you how much I've learned, even as a beginner and if it helps one person just think a little bit differently about it it will have been bloody worth it it also goes without saying i hope but if you are currently in a mental health urgent crisis please don't sit through this whole video i'll leave some links below please go and seek some actual help from an actual professional me no professional no expert okay good let's do some lies therapy makes you self-centered surprisingly enough past Lena, annoying people do go to therapy. Do you know who also goes to therapy? Not annoying people. Lots of different kinds of people go to therapy. And I think there is a particularly a perception in my country, in Britain, uh, that Americans <laughs> are really annoying about talking about therapy. And there is like an obnoxious uh, sector of every country and society that is a, lo a little bit annoying when they talk about it. But honestly, having actually gone through it, I kind of see why. Now you probably already know this because judging by this Instagram poll I did, a lot of you have already been. So I'm really talking to that percentage of you who have never been to therapy, but stats show, know what you'd go to therapy about. Like you have a thing that you know, if you went to therapy, that is, that's the thing you'd talk about. I do think the language of therapy often gets co-opted and Michelle Ellman talks a lot about this in her books and in her short form video. So I don't have time to unpack that here, but I also started to think that actually the people who I met who were really annoying when they talked about therapy might have been even worse had they not been to therapy. It doesn't mean that it wasn't still a really good thing for them. And I've also noticed that when something really does help somebody and change their lives, they do become a bit annoying about it. I'm very annoying about The Sound of Music. I'm incredibly obnoxious about how much I think Wicked is the best book ever. So many people are annoying about Taylor Swift, but you know why? It's because they're having a good time. It seems so simple. And yet, I also realise that there's a difference between being self- interested and self-centred for 60 minutes every week or every fortnight and living an actual selfish life and going to one can prevent the other it kind of reminds me of that stupid joke that's like how can you tell who the vegans are don't worry they'll tell you <laughs> and it does feel the same with therapy sometimes but it actually kind of makes sense because i now think it's a way in for people to talk with you about the things that they might go to therapy about or be a bit vulnerable. And there is often a bit of haughtiness that can accidentally come across when somebody's feeling vulnerable. So it's all starting to make goddamn sense. And I also started to have, as I got older, a lot of friends that weren't annoying and went to therapy interesting development and I had a, quite a few of them kind of gently prod me in that direction when I talked about the kind of mental issues I was having and it was so helpful and without me being able to sit there and ask them stupid questions and and try and think it through I literally never would have been so if you don't have somebody like that I'm gonna be your annoying therapy friend <laughs> for the next 20 minutes but they helped me see that it's not self-centered to go and get your body checked out in case there's something wrong or ask somebody who's an expert what's wrong with your body and your brain is part of your body it's not weird to go to the doctor and ask for a lump to be checked out or say hey actually there's been a pain in my right hip for about a year now can i can we 
Do you think do you think you could use your decades of um, experience to maybe uh, shed some light on that so I don't have to just keep Googling it? Another thing that's part of this is I think that because I was talking to people in my life about it, I have a good support network. I have people that will listen to me for like a long period of time if I want to rant about something. I thought that that would be the same and it just so was not. <laughs> It's just not. It's just not the same. Um, it turns out the field of mental health, psychoanalysis, coaching, counselling, therapy—they're all things just like my degree that people train in. So they're quite complicated, and somebody can't just guess how to do it because they're your friend or because they love you. What was I thinking? <laughs> lie number two: therapy is a privilege. This is only a semi-lie. It totally is a privilege, if that's what you mean <laughs> by privilege. I live in the UK. Hi. Uh, we have the NHS here, which means that technically we are supposed to get all of our health care for free. However, National Health Service is kind of on its knees right now. And while I don't have time to go into that right now, I have to say from a statistical and anecdotal level from people in my own life, I know that therapy doesn't function the way it should for free in this country. We aren't here today to talk about the way I think things should be or the way we all wish they were. We're here today to talk about how to operate in the world the way it is. And the way it is now is that a lot of the time, if you want to be seen for a long period of time or get specific kinds of treatment, you're either gonna have to go on a waiting list or you are going to have to fund it yourself. It sucks. <laughs> it really does. But my mindset on this idea of it being a privilege has also completely changed in the in the way that abortion isn't a privilege. Abortion is healthcare. Like so is ther therapy is healthcare. The act of getting it isn't a cherry on top or a treat or a luxury. It is something just like I always say, houses are necessities at luxury prices. That's what therapy is. And I am <laughs> beyond lucky to be able to afford it. But even somebody who actually turns out did have the cash to spend on it, I felt like it was a frivolous pursuit. I, I felt, I told myself I couldn't afford it because I had all these other things that were going out that I was like, well, that's where all this money needs to go. And I have really rethought my brain around it. The average price of a therapy session in the UK, um, I believe is between like 50 and 70 pounds an hour, which seems like a lot, but I've got two theories about why that is. Both of them, I think are true together. The first one is that we're not really used to paying each other. I grew up and I think most people in this country grew up um, with a pay system where like your parents go to work and then they get a paycheck. You rarely are paying the people in your community apart from for, like odd jobs or for builder jobs. So you don't really think about what your labor is worth per hour and what other people's are. With therapists, they have to be trained for years and years and years. That's expensive. They can probably, I don't know, fit in four or five sessions a day maximum. But I imagine they probably need a lot of time to prep beforehand and maybe even recover afterwards. Like it's a really emotionally labor intensive job. And when we're paying each other, we're also not thinking about how we're kind of employing somebody. And if we agree with labor rights, then we also want to compensate them enough to cover things like sick days, holidays, maternity leave, admin days. They're all things that we are employing somebody, but we're not obliged to cover those. So we compensate for that by paying them slightly higher than maybe like a POYE hourly rate would be. Am I making any sense? So that's like one revelation I've had. It's like, oh, I'm just not used to charging for what my hours are worth accurately. And I'm also not used to paying the people in my community. So I have no idea really what somebody's time is worth, but I guess I would say it's probably 50 to 70 pounds an hour. It's also a sign, and this is why like I'm not gonna go in on, oh, well, you're just, you think you're poor, but you're not. <laughs> like I'm not saying that. I'm saying that, the price of therapy, I think, is fair. It's just that we as a community, as a society, are not being compensated fairly for the work that we do. It's not that therapy is expensive. It's that we're not being paid enough. And I think maybe there's a lot of shame around feeling like you can't pay for therapy. And I, I reject that shame for you, for me, for everybody. It is ridiculous that we can't pay for this basic right. And it would also be cheaper for the country to fix everybody's brains. We'd be more productive, more effective, less ill physically, as well as mentally. All of that costs the country money. So if they just cover, anyway, we're not, 
get off the socialist podium, Lena, concentrate. But what I am saying is if you do have any expendable income in this hellhole pit of an economy right now, I would encourage you to, if you're not already treating therapy like you treat uh, money you'd spend on the dentist or the optician. It is wild to me that um, before this experience, I Easy, if, I'm, if my prescription changes in my eyes or if, if I need like something doing to my teeth because I don't have an NHS dentist because <laughs> see rant about why the NHS is on its knees, I wouldn't have hesitated to spend that money. That is, that is money I take out of my emergency reserves or out of extra money I put aside because I know that I will have expenses like that that are non-negotiable. They're things that I really do need and after i've accommodated and planned for all of those things then i think oh i can um get more haircuts or or i can go to see the eras tour or i can commit to like a slightly fancier holiday not that we we deserve all those things just to be clear but i really think if you're struggling in any way it is okay acceptable to be vocal with the people in your life that you are making it a financial priority and that's not weird or bougie. In the same way that I'd never dream of paying for a holiday before I paid for a glasses prescription because I'd be on holiday but I wouldn't be able to see the holiday, like I wouldn't be able to enjoy it, I wouldn't be able to actually physically see it. I kind of feel the same about therapy, like without it you might not be able to enjoy the other experiences that are supposed to be healing or nice or good for the soul. And it's possible that people in your life might be a bit weird about that, but what they don't know is that making your mental health a financial priority is extremely punk. It's extremely punk in a world like this. And I keep bringing up the optician because I actually did the maths. And another thing I didn't realize is that you can have like short courses of therapy. You don't like, just because you're going doesn't mean you have to go forever. I ended up going for way less time than I thought I was going to and that I'd budgeted for and I made did the maths and I realized that I've actually paid my optician more this year than I have my therapist and that's wild to me I mean I have very bad eyesight so that might not be the same for everybody but if it's not just that you're struggling to justify and fit therapy into your budget but you are literally struggling for the material money to pay for it I do have a few suggestions like I said some problems can be dealt with in layers or or dealt with in ways that you might not think. You might have a, a problem that will need years of therapy, but I thought that I was going to need years of therapy. I was really fucked up about this and it was linked to a lot of other very, very negative and private experiences I've had in my life around cars that is kind of almost final destination-y to me in my head. I'm like, are cars trying to get me and my family? Just the quick, just putting that out there, universe. Every therapist should give you a first free consultation on the phone or in person. And in that, you shouldn't be ashamed. You're well within your rights to say, hey, this is what I've budgeted for. I've budgeted for this many sessions. Here's some of the outcomes that I'd like. Do you think that's realistic within the time? And would you advise opening up the can of worms if this is what I've got? Or would you advise waiting a little bit more seeing how many sessions I might need. I know it's hard to predict, but like just a ballpark, like do you think this is sensible mentally for me to start this course, this process? Or do you think we should pare down the expectations if I can only afford six sessions or 10 sessions or 20 sessions? Any therapist worth their meat, I think should be able to answer that question for you. And it shouldn't be weird and it shouldn't be shameful. It's also totally okay and very common uh, to ask therapists if they have a pro bono program of like free sessions they do for people and also a slight scale payment scheme where they do have a few slots where you can pay a little bit less if you're low income. If you are employed by like an institution or a company, a lot of HR departments do have an employee assistant program. So it's okay to ask your HR department about that and it should be 100% confidential. There are also charities and third sector organizations that can help you out for like specific problems. There's lots of ones around being a carer or grieving or eating disorders. Like they're all things that have their own specific thing. So it's worth checking out. And I didn't also didn't know this, in the UK, you can refer yourself to your local IAPT, which should put you on the path to help you. And you don't need a d official diagnosis of anything and you can self-refer yourself without having to see a GP at all. Mind blown? Mind blown! The next lie is you have to be in a mental health crisis to go to a therapist. Again, now I'm looking back on this, I don't know how I was making any sense. If you're going to the NHS or somebody is referring you, you just have to be honest. It's not your business whether the professionals decide you need therapy or not. It's your job to turn up and ask their professional opinion if you need it. Now, of course, sometimes they're wrong and they say you don't need it and you actually do need it. That's another complicated political story. But what I'm saying to you is that 
it's not up to you to sit in your living room and decide without a doubt that you don't need any assistance. That's silly. There are professionals that are literally paid to sit there and work out whether people need assistance or not. So let them do their job. If you're paying for it privately, of course you don't need to be in a mental health. Why was I thinking that? Like I'm paying for it. So it doesn't matter. Nobody, I don't go to the hairdresser and somebody goes, do you really need your haircut? How many split ends do you really have? You don't hear that somebody's gone to the dentist and ask like how rotten their teeth really are. So don't treat yourself like that either. Like it's your money. You, unbelievably, you are allowed to do what you want with it. And if it doesn't work, you can just stop going. You have to assess it. But to me, the risk is very, very low compared to what the payoff could be if it does work. Once you go, you have to go for life. I've just already addressed this a little bit, but I do think it's something that I really believed. Um, what I also didn't give therapists the benefit of the doubt about is that they will plan that with you. They will see it coming. If you help them and are honest and upfront with them, they can help you plan for how long you do it for. And they won't just leave you in the lurch one day. They can sew things up for you or help you plan to stop should you not be able to afford it in the future, that's totally fine. I went to address something specific that I think like then bleeded into other parts of my life that I wanted to talk about, but I didn't stop therapy because I was mentally well in every single way. There's no problems in my life I wanna chat through. I'd got to the point where I was at peace with the specific thing that I was struggling with. And it's not that I'm, I'm too, I'm never going to drive. Like that is just me, that's me now. I can't drive <laughs> because of this incident really. But that wasn't the outcome I was asking for for the therapist. I imagine if I'd wanted that, I'd have to go for a lot longer. But I was like, I just want to feel like a safe pedestrian pedestrian and I want to be vaguely chill when I'm a passenger in a car and we got there. So this delusion that I had that like I would only be able to stop therapy when I was 100% mentally okay with everything ever and I was never going to have another problem is silly. And now I also have this person that I trust and I have a relationship with in some way. I know that I can go back to her if I do have another problem or if it gets worse again. It's just like knowing where my hardware shop is in my town or knowing who the gutter cleaners are. Like I know who can clean out my brain a bit if things get bad again. I have like my person that I can go to for that. And that actually also just makes me feel a little bit mentally more well <laughs> the rest of my life. Just like knowing what the plan is, having gone for short sessions of therapy and then knowing that that is the backup plan should things hit the fan i think might actually prevent things hitting the fan am i making any sense it's too late for me i can't change it is true that i think a lot of therapy that i've read about uh, seems to you know dig back into your past work out how you've made the assumptions and the patterns and the thought processes that you have and just like check over that check over to see whether that's still relevant whether that information is still true and work it out my first session my therapist just sat me down and was like tell me about which moments in your past you would deem significant like tell me about some significant things that have happened to you in your life like good and bad but i also think there's a lot of pseudoscience and like old wives tales is old saying old wives tales sexist <laughs> somebody tell me in the comments before it probably is isn't it anyway some mythological tales about how like once something happens to you in childhood it's completely unfixable it's like soldered into your brain patterns like you're you're scrambled for life basically now a book that i read before going to therapy because of course i fucking got a book of course i went to the library and checked out a book about it before i did anything about it because do i do anything in this world without doing that i checked out this book called therapy is magic by joe love and honestly i can say i would not have gone to therapy without dipping into this book it's just the simplest most accessible book about chatting you through all the different processes and things that are available and support that's available to you like different kinds of therapy that are available like all of the stupid questions you're like i didn't i don't even know what questions to ask about this topic i have no concept for it i didn't grow up with anybody who had therapy i've never been taught about it in a formal or informal setting so it's genuinely like one of the only like accessible simple like beginner books i've seen on it and i'm like why why is it the only one anyway i just wanted to read you some of this because i it blew my tiny little brain out what is very cool about therapy is the potential for it to change our brains on a structural level the brain and the nerve circuitry are more malleable, more plastic than previously supposed. Where the thought was once we reached a certain age, that was us, 
our brains set in our ways for our life. But it turns out that rewiring is very much possible in adult life. Maybe not always easy, but we do know now that it is possible. So she talks a lot about the kind of new science around it. This change in the functional architecture of our brains, creating new neurons or pathways is called neuroplasticity. Although neuroplasticity hasn't been understood until relatively recently, it has actually been very much in action in the therapy room for hundreds of years. With therapists using their connection skill in order to galvanize change in their clients, well before it was ever discovered that they were in fact doing it on a neurobiological level. What? This is why, like, you have to remember, as you get older, you went to school further and further away in history, which is sad, but very much true. And what I was taught in the 90s about stuff, like, I constantly have to check if that's still relevant because the science the scientists have been sciencing and um i was lied to by a mission and um apparently i'm part of history now and so is my education a way in which therapists can change our brains is by modeling how to respond to situations or thought patterns in a more positive way than we are currently attempting this act of observing a therapist's approach to a problem in a different more positive way can and does activate something called mirror neurons the activation of these mirror neurons on repeated occasions can strengthen the pathways in our own brains, meaning the next time we are presented with the same issue or problem, we won't take the old path, but we'll mirror the more positive route we have learned. I rest my case. <laughs> I also don't think it's an all or nothing approach that we need. It's not like, oh, I need to be completely healed. And if that's impossible, then there's no point in going. If it can be 5% better, I'd say, mate, that's probably worth it. Like 5% better neuron linking pathways sign me up the next light it's gonna be really awkward i am somebody who's actually very outgoing <laughs> if you couldn't tell by this gobby ass channel and like generally not very like nervous in social situations but i was really like shaky and like unnerved and a bit twitchy before i went to see my therapist for the first time i was really nervous and i think it's because it was a uh, unusual it was actually of course fine but i did take a little bit of time to adjust to a social situation where i couldn't deflect or ask the other person how they are or what they're doing do you know what i mean making it all about me and then also i definitely got called out a few times for telling a story uh, the same way a few times with like the same jokes and that being like a defense mechanism there was definitely a little bit of that but interestingly while i found it awkward at the beginning i know quite a few people who are generally quite socially anxious or awkward who found the therapy setting like immediately very calming so i think who you are in social situations doesn't predict how you would be in a therapy room and it very much depends on your therapist making you feel comfortable but also accepting that like this is a weird different social dynamic to try out and it could be really beneficial but it is gonna probably feel a little bit weird so yeah it was I, this isn't a complete lie but it, it it wasn't a bad thing that it was awkward do you know what i mean and it was only awkward for like the first session so i think an hour of awkwardness for like all of this healing <laughs> bargain <laughs> i think it's also helpful to think about it from a body perspective in that if i was nervous about having a smear test and i was like oh i don't want to go because i'll feel awkward i would say to myself well tough tits lena you're going for the fucking smear test you need it your body is more important than feeling comfortable for an hour you can't tell the good ones from the bad ones now this isn't true you can totally tell the good ones from the bad ones it is like finding a therapist in this day and age is kind of like online dating you have do have to look at their profiles and check them out and of course you are going to get a few wacky choices in there a little bit of trial and error maybe necessary but thanks to this book and to some other things i've looked at on the internet i have actually made some thorough notes on this so get your pens out folks i'm gonna get my notes i'm gonna tell you what i know now there are currently no legal restrictions around calling yourself a psychotherapist. <laughs> Good. However, there are some titles within the field that are regulated and protected. This includes registered psychotherapist and there are professional bodies such as the UKCP that protect such titles. Now, I found my therapist through this website called counsellingdirectory.org.uk, otherwise known as Zoopla. <laughs> <laughs> for therapists they only have accredited people on their site and they have a page explaining what the accreditations are but it is worth knowing like my therapist told me that they only check your credentials when you join the site they don't like keep up checking so it is worth double checking that they definitely are accredited i also asked my therapist in my last session like what would be some red flags if somebody's trying to find a therapist like what would be the red flags for you and she said 
no free consultation that is a red flag most people should give you at least a 10 or 15 minute chat on the phone to explain like what they do and how they do it that's like bare min so again like i think it's interesting if you're worried about spending the money on therapy like you don't just have to drop 50 quid on a complete stranger you are allowed to try before you buy and you could also just like ring a few therapists have some conversations and not go with any of them that's also allowed second red flag would be no accreditation or membership to a body mine was accredited with the british association for counseling and psychotherapy bacp uh, which is a pretty common one but there are some other ones i'll leave them in the description if you want them the next one is if you ask the question like do you have insurance like my therapist just offered that up and i was like oh i didn't think you even needed insurance she's like yeah all therapists need insurance so i feel like even if you don't like check their paperwork if you ask them are you insured and they get weird or they don't know what you're talking about another red flag the next one i hadn't thought but she said it and i was like oh yeah she said if somebody says to you I can work with anyone. That is a huge red flag because that isn't possible for any therapist. There will be things that they don't know about or don't specialize in. And I can see why that, like saying those words might be a little bit like, mm, what, anyone? In any profession, that would be a little bit weird. Like I wouldn't say I can make a YouTube video that anybody will love. Like that would be <laughs> weird. When I was talking to therapists, I asked things like, have you worked with somebody with my problem before? Uh, what techniques did you use on them? That kind of thing. I think it's just worth asking. Uh, and then the final one uh, is just the red flag is if you don't feel comfortable with them, do you feel comfortable asking them questions? Because if you can't feel comfortable asking them questions about how long the appointments are or what their methods are or how they'd like to be paid, then wait till you start digging up your deepest anxieties. Now that, that's going to be awkward. So the bar is low, like, but make sure you feel like vaguely comfortable communicating with them when you have your free consultation. Now, if you want to learn more about this topic, I would urge you <laughs> not to ask me because I've literally just told you everything I know. Like that's it, that's all I know. This book, Therapy is Magic, was really helpful for me, but any other like ways to like legitimately research therapy, I think is really valuable before you go into it. This, the part that really helped me the most was just like talking through what your first session will be like. Like just the logistics of that, I was like, I don't even know, how do I even, what? But she also covers loads of stuff that I don't know anything about, more serious mental health problems, how online therapy is, whether that's beneficial, all of those things are covered in the book. I guess the last lie that I'm perpetuating with this video is you have to lie on a couch like this and look up and tell everybody your problems. I just sat opposite my therapist and it was totally fine. So I think it's, some, sometimes it's helpful for people, but it's also just like a Victorian stereotype. I just thought it'd be a fun way to shoot the video. If you enjoyed it, thank you so much for being here and for humoring my beginner's, very deeply beginner's guide to therapy and how I feel about it specifically. I really hope that if you are able you give it a chance because I feel like a fool, like a, like a goddamn fool <laughs> for thinking it was bullshit. I know I shared a very fast anecdotal experience at the beginning of this video, but I have to assure you that I am totally fine. And if I ever feel like sharing more about it, I will, because oh wow, was it a story. But right now that's pretty much all I'm comfortable talking about on the internet about it. So thank you in advance <laughs> for respecting my boundaries. Hashtag boundaries, hashtag therapy. She's getting healed. This video is made possible by the Gumption Club who tip me per video to make sure these videos keep happening. So if you hate my videos, you only have them to blame. If you like this video, I think you'll like one of these videos. And until next time, Frog Snog out.